This is a recording of A Lesson Before Dying by Ernest J. Gaines, Chapter 8. The week after the superintendent paid his visit to the school, we got our first load of wood for winter. Two old men brought the wagon load about 11 o'clock that morning. We did not have a gate wide enough for the wagon to come through, so the men came into the yard next door to the church. One got down off the wagon to open the gate, and the other drove the wagon into the yard. I could not see them, but I could hear them. They were joking about the mules, the wood, and the weather. One of them said, Don't let Bird hang us up in that ditch now. I don't feel like unloading all this wood way out here and got to put it on that wagon again. She gone, pull? the other one said. Hi there, Bird. Get them shoulders in there. I heard the wagon cross the ditch and enter the yard. All right, I said to the class. The first one who looks outside will spend an hour in the corner. They can do pretty well without you. The wagon came further into the yard on the other side of the fence, passing the church windows. I could see the two mules, one big and red, the other small and dark brown with long droopy ears, pulling hard onto the chains. Then I saw the long poles of wood stacked high upon the wagon, with one of the old men riding atop the wood while the other, the one who had opened the gate, walked alongside the wagon. They were still joking and laughing. Lewis Washington, Jr., get back into that corner and face the wall. But, Mr. Wiggins, now you was looking out that window, too, now. I seen you. Just out the corner of my eye, I said. Now, I was just looking out the corner of my eye, too, Mr. Wiggins. In that case, I won't punish you for looking out the window, I said. But I'm going to punish you for using bad grammar. You were supposed to say you were looking out the window, Mr. Wiggins, not you was looking out the window, Mr. Wiggins. Get back in that corner and face the wall and stay there. One more word out of you and you'll spend the rest of the day standing on one leg. Sitting at my desk, I could hear the old men unloading wood, throwing the long poles against the fence and into the churchyard. They were still kidding each other. Show me them grits. Show me them grits you had this morning. I got my end up. Well, I got the heavy end. You sure got that right. They both laughed, and I heard the wood come across the fence. This went on for half an hour. Then one of the men knocked on the back door, and I went to see what he wanted. Professor, he said and smiled. Henry Lewis was a short black man with hardly any teeth. His hands were the color and texture of the legs of a snapping turtle. He wore an old straw hat, a green and brown plaid shirt, khaki pants, and rubber boots. He had grandchildren in the school. Some wood there, he said. I'm leaving the saw and a couple of them axes. Your boys can chop it up. Appreciate it, Mr. Lewis, I said. Glad to be of service. I spoke to Amos Thomas, who sat on the wagon. The thin brown-skinned man nodded at me. That ought to hold you a while. Mr. Lewis said to me, just call for it run out. Somebody get you another load. Thanks, I said. Bye, Professor. Bye, Mr. Lewis. Mr. Thomas. I returned to my desk. All right, I said to the class. It's a quarter to twelve now. I'm letting you out early because you'll have to chop wood this afternoon. I want you all back up here by twelve thirty. That afternoon, I stood by the fence while the fifth and sixth grade boys sawed and chopped the wood. The smaller boys and all the girls were inside. They wanted to know why they had to study while the older boys were outside having fun. I told them that they could have fun the next day picking up chips and stacking wood while the older boys were inside studying. They did not see this as quite the same. But when I didn't give them any other choice, they grudgingly relented. I gave them assignments and left Irene Cole in charge. Standing by the fence, I watched the five older boys saw and chop the wood. Two would saw while another would straddle the wood pole to keep it steady. The other two boys split logs and chopped up small branches with the axes. They laughed and kidded each other while they worked. And I thought to myself, what am I doing? Am I reaching them at all? They were acting exactly as the old men did earlier. They are 50 years younger, maybe more, but doing the same thing those old men did, who never attended school a day in their lives. 
Is it just a vicious circle? Am I doing anything? After a while, they exchanged the saw and axes. The ones who had been sawing were now splitting logs. The other two were pulling on the handles of the saw. The smallest boy still held the log as steady as he could with his hands and knees. With my back to the fence as I watched them, I remembered when it was I who had swung that axe and pulled my end of the saw. And I remembered the others too. Bill, Jerry, Claudie, Smitty, Snowball, all the others. They had chopped wood here too. Then they were gone, gone to the fields, to the small towns, to the cities where they died. There was always news coming back to the quarter about someone who had been killed or sent to prison for killing someone else. Snowball stabbed to death at a nightclub in Port Allen. Claudie killed by a woman in New Orleans. Smitty sent to the state penitentiary at Angola for manslaughter. And there were others who did not go anywhere but simply died slower. The big mulatto from Poilaya had predicted it, hadn't he? It was he, Matthew Antoine, as teacher then, who stood by the fence while we chopped the wood. He told us then that most of us would die violently, and those who did not would be brought down to the level of beast. Told us that there was no other choice but to run and run. That he was living testimony of someone who should have run. That in him he did not say all this, but we felt it. There was nothing but hatred for himself as well as contempt for us. He hated himself for the mixture of his blood and the cowardice of his being. And he hated us for daily reminding him of it. Now, he did not tell us this, but daily he showed us this. As clearly as anything, he showed his hatred for himself and for us. He could teach any of us only one thing, and that one thing was flight. Because there was no freedom here. He said it, and he didn't say it, but we felt it. When we told our people how we felt, they told us to go back and learn all we could. There were those who did go back to learn others who only went back. And having no place to run, they went into the fields. Others went into the small towns and cities seeking work and even did worse. But she told me that I would not be one of the others, that I would learn as much as he could teach me, and then I would go away to learn from someone else, but that I would learn as much as he could teach me. And when he saw that I wanted to learn, he hated me even more than he did the others, because I challenged him when the others did not. The others believed what he said. They went out into the fields, went into the small towns and into the cities, and died. So you think you can, he said. So you think you can? No, he did not say it with words, only his, with his eyes. You will be the loser, my friend. Maybe he did not say friend. He probably didn't say friend. Fool, more likely. Anyway, you will be the loser, he said. Yes, I will teach you. You want to learn? I will help you learn. Maybe in that way I will be free, knowing that someone else has taken the burden. Good, good. You want to learn? Good. Here is the burden. Even after I had gone away for further education, on returning to the plantation to visit my aunt, I could still see the hatred in him. And after he had retired from teaching because of ill health, and I would visit him at his home in Polaya, I would still feel his hatred for himself, for me, for the world. Once, as I sat at the fireplace with him, he said to me, Nothing pleases me more than when I hear of something wrong. Hitler had his reasons, and even the Ku Klux Klans of the South, for what they do. You don't believe me, do you? He asked me. No, sir, I don't, I said. You will one day, he said. I told you what you should have done, but you no, know, you want to stay. Well, you will believe me one day. When you see that those five and a half months you spend at that church each year are just a waste of your time, you will. You will. You'll see that it'll take more than five and a half months to wipe away, peel, scrape away the blanket of ignorance that has been plastered and replastered over those brains in the past 300 years. You'll see. Then he would be quiet for a long time while we both stared into the fire. I'm cold, he said one day while we sat there looking into the fire.
I got up to put another piece of wood. That's no good, he said. It'll still be cold. I'll always be cold. He looked at me. You'll see. You'll see. I must, I said. No, you don't must, he said. You want to, but you don't must. You did, I said. Yes, I did. But I told you not to. I told you to go. God has looked after them these past 300 years without your help. He won't. God? I said, because I had never heard him say God before. Because when we had said our Bible verses for him, he seemed to have hatred, hated the very words we spoke. Sir, did I hear you say, I'm cold? He cut me off. I stay cold. You better go. Come back some other time if you like. I made a mistake. I came back a month later. I remember that it was cold that day too. Now about that mulatto teacher and me. There was no love there for each other. There was not even respect. We were enemies, if anything at all. He hated me, and I knew it, and he knew I knew it. I didn't like him, but I needed him. Needed him to tell me something that none of the others could or would. I brought some wine that day. He sent me into the kitchen to get two glasses. This will warm you up, I said. Nothing can warm me up, he said. He sat in the rocker gazing down at the fire with the blanket tight around him. He was a big boned man, but very skinny now. To flight, he said, raising his glass. But you didn't go, I said. I'm Creole, he said. Can't you tell? What was that, I asked him. That was it, he said. I'm Creole. Do you know what a Creole is? A lying, cowardly blank. Didn't you know that? No, I didn't know that, I said. I was afraid, he said, looking into the fire. I was afraid to run away. What am I? Look at me. Where else could I have felt superior to so many but here? Is that important, I asked him. It is, he said. For everyone, especially for the whites and the near whites, it is important. Do you feel superior to me? I asked him. Of course, he said, don't be a darn fool. I am superior to you. I am superior to any man blacker than me. Is that why you hate me? I asked him. Exactly, he said, because that superior blank out there said I am you. Do you think he is superior to you? I asked him. Of course, he said. Don't you? No, I said. Just stay here long enough, he said. He'll make you the blank you were born to be. My only choice is to run then? I asked him. That was your choice. But you won't. You want to prove I'm wrong. Well, you'll visit my grave one day and tell me how right I was. Tell me more, I said. What's wrong with that university? He asked. Don't they tell you? They tell me how to succeed in the South as a colored man. They tell me about reading, writing, and arithmetic. I need to know about life. I can't tell you anything about life, he said. What do I know about life? I stayed here. You have to go away to know about life. There's no life here. There's nothing but ignorance here. You want to know about life? Well, it's too late. Forget it. Just go on and be the blank you were born to be. But forget about life. You make me tired and I'm cold. The wine doesn't help. I visited him again only a month or two before he died in the winter of 42. He was 43 years old. That was my first year as a teacher. I had been teaching two or three weeks when I visited him. We had just gotten our first load of wood for winter. Maybe that's why I had gone to see him. I could always remember that first load of wood for winter, how we older boys had chopped the wood into smaller pieces while we stood back against the fence overseeing us. He looked terribly frail that day. I hadn't seen him in several months. He was being looked after by a relative who did not care too much for anyone visiting him, and especially darker people. She had admitted me into the room and left us. He sat at the fireplace. Summer or winter, he always sat at the fireplace when he was inside. We shook hands. His large hand was cold and bony. He was coughing a lot. We got our first load of wood last week, I told him. Nothing changes, he said. 
I guess I'm a genuine teacher now, I said. He nodded and coughed. He didn't seem to want to talk. Still, I sat there, both of us gazing into the fire. Any advice? I asked him. It doesn't matter anymore, he said. Just do the best you can, but it won't matter. Chapter 9 At 1.30, I left school to take Miss Emma into Bayoni. She came out on the porch with Tante Lou, and she had a basket hung over one arm and a handbag in the other hand. Tante Lou closed the door to keep the heat in the room, and she and Miss Emma came down the walk and out to the car. Miss Emma wore her brown overcoat with the rabbit fur around the collar and cuffs. Tante Lou wore only a sweater, so I figured she was not going to Bayani with us. She opened the door for Miss Emma to get into the back seat, and after shutting it, she leaned against the door to continue their conversation. I am sure they had been talking all day, but still they had things to talk about. This way is best, she said. Miss Emma may have nodded, but I am not sure. I refused to look into the mirror at them. Anything else he need, let me know, my aunt went on. They got plenty old socks and shirts round the place. I think we're supposed to be there round two, I said, without looking back at them. I could feel both sets of eyes on the back of my neck. Tell him I'm praying, my aunt said. Y'all better go. I see you when you get back. She was talking to Miss Emma, not to me. She knew how I felt about the whole thing. I drove further down the corridor and turned around. My aunt was standing where we had left her. She was waving now. You might have thought we were going to China instead of the 13 miles to Bayoni. Driving along the St. Charles River, I could feel Miss Emma not looking at me, not looking at anything, just thinking. Maybe once or twice she glanced in my direction, but most of the time she was lost in thought. Like my aunt, she knew how much I hated all this. So the 13 miles to Bayani were driven in silence. I didn't say anything to her. She didn't say anything to me. I never looked at her in the rearview mirror. I never turned my head to the river on my right or to the houses on the side of the road to my left. As far up the highway as you could see were stalks of sugar cane that had fallen off the trailers on the way to the mill. The people were gathering pecans on either side of the road, but I looked at them only from a distance. If they waved, I did not wave back. I didn't want Miss Emma to think for a moment that my mood had changed. The courthouse, like most of the public buildings in town, was made of red brick. Built around the turn of the century, it looked like a small castle you might see in the countryside somewhere in Europe. The parking lot that surrounded the courthouse was covered with crushed seashells. A statue of a Confederate soldier stood to the right of the walk that led up to the courthouse door. Above the head of the statue, national, state, and Confederate flags flew on long metal poles. The big clock on the tower struck two as I parked a opposite the statue and the flags. I took Miss Emma a while to get out of the car, so by the time we came into the sheriff's office, the clock on the wall there said five after two. Two deputies dressed in gray chinos and a colored prisoner in green overalls with the letter P on the back were in the office. The deputy behind the desk was giving the prisoner instructions. The younger deputy who stood beside the desk, looked at us. I come to see Jefferson, Miss Emma said. The young deputy nodded to the deputy who was giving orders to the prisoner. It had something to do with the floor of the outside toilet. The toilet was for colored people who came to the courthouse, and it was down in the basement. You entered it from the courthouse parking lot. I had gone in there once or twice myself, but it was always filthy, and like everyone I knew, I tried to avoid going down there. But that was the only place to go. The toilets inside were for whites only. I wanted that done before I leave from here, the deputy told the prisoner. I mean that. You hear? The prisoner, 15 or 16 years old, bowed his head and left. I come to see my boy, Jefferson. Miss Emma told the deputy behind the desk. What you got there? He asked her. Just some food, some clean clothes for him, Miss Emma said. Paul, the older man said. The deputy who stood beside the desk came toward us. How's he been? Miss Emma asked as the deputy in charge. 
quiet, the deputy said. Yes, sir, Miss Emma said. The deputy grinned. Jefferson's been quiet, Paul, the young deputy, told Miss Emma. Thank you, sir, Miss Emma said to him. The deputy went through the basket of food, fried chicken, bread, baked sweet potatoes, tea cakes. Then he went through the handbag of clothes. There was a pair of old blue jeans, an old overwashed brown shirt, a pair of long johns, and two pairs of my socks, which my aunt had given Miss Emma for Jefferson. Empty your pockets, he said to me. I had nothing but a wallet, a handkerchief, and some loose change. I had left my keys in the car. I laid the things on the desk. Is that it? The deputy asked me. He had brown hair and gray-blue eyes, and he appeared to be a couple of years younger than I was. He looked pretty decent. The one behind the desk didn't look decent at all. His eyes were the color of cement. He had a big neck and a fleshy face. He was much older and much heavier than Paul. Paul patted me down to see if I had taken everything out of my pockets. Then he told me that I could put my things back. Sheriff explained everything to y'all, the depu chief deputy asked us. Sir, Miss Emma said. The chief deputy could see that I didn't like him, and I could tell he didn't like me. But he knew who was in charge and that I would have to take anything he dished out. No knives, no forks, no plates, pans, he said to Miss Emma. That was after he had looked at me a long time to let me know what he thought of me. No hat pins, no pocket knives, no razor blades, no ice picks, he said, looking at me again. Jefferson won't never do nothing like that, Miss Emma said. You can never tell, the deputy said. Take them on up, Paul. Follow me, the young deputy said. We followed him down a long, dark corridor, passing offices with open doors and bathrooms for white ladies and white men. At the end of the corridor, we had to go up a set of stairs. The stairs were made of steel. There were six steps, then a landing, a sharp turn, and another six steps. Then we went through a heavy steel door to the area where the prisoners were quartered. The white prisoners were also on this floor, but in a separate section. I counted eight cells for black prisoners with two bunks to each cell. Half of the cells were empty. The others had one or two prisoners. They reached their hands out behind, between the bars, and asked for cigarettes or money. Miss Emma stopped to talk to them. She told them she didn't have any money, but she had brought some food for Jefferson. If there was anything left, she would give it to them. They asked me for money. I gave them the change I had. There was an empty cell between Jefferson and the rest of the prisoners. He was at the end of the cell block and was lying on his bunk when we came up. The deputy unlocked the door for us, and Miss Emma and I went in. The deputy told us that he would have to lock us in, and that he would return within an hour. Miss Emma thanked him, and he locked the door and left. Jefferson still lay on his bunk, staring up at the ceiling. He didn't look at us once. How you feel, Jefferson? Miss Emma asked him. He didn't answer and kept his eyes on the ceiling. The cell was roughly six by ten, with a metal bunk covered by a thin mattress and a woolen army blanket, a toilet without seat or toilet paper, a wash bowl brownish from residue and grime, a small metal shelf upon which was a pan, a tin cup, and a tablespoon. A single light bulb hung over the center of the cell, and at the end opposite the door was a barred window, which looked out onto a sycamore tree behind the courthouse. I could see the sunlight on the upper leaves, but the window was too high to catch sight of any other buildings or the ground. I come to see you and bring you something, Miss Emma said. We were standing because there was no place to sit. You been all right? she asked him. He lay there looking up at the ceiling. His hair had grown out since the trial, but I am sure he had not combed it once. I told myself that I would bring him a comb next time I came. I brought Professor Wiggins, Miss Emma said. I brought you some fried chicken, some good old yams, and I brought you some tea cakes, too. He looked up at the ceiling. Ain't you going to ask me to sit down, Jefferson? He looked up at the ceiling, but he wasn't seeing the ceiling. Miss Emma put the handbag of clothes and the basket of food on the floor and sat down on the bunk beside him. 
I should say that she sat as much of herself on the bunk as she could. About half, I would say. She passed her hand over his forehead and over his hair. Ain't you going to speak to me, Jefferson? She asked. He remained quiet. She stroked his hair again. You want to just talk to me? You want Professor Wiggins to leave? He didn't answer her. You want me to go? And you just talk to Professor Wiggins? He still didn't answer. She looked up at me. She was ready to cry. And I wished I were somewhere else. Hand me that basket, Grant, she said. I passed her the basket and she took out a piece of chicken wrapped in brown paper. She unwrapped the drumstick and held it before Jefferson. Look what I brought you, she said. I know how much you like my fried chicken. Brought you some yams and some tea cakes, too. Ain't you going to try some of it? It don't matter, I heard him say. He was looking up at the ceiling. What don't matter? He didn't answer. What don't matter, Jefferson? Nothing don't matter, he said, looking up at the ceiling but not seeing the ceiling. It matter to me, Jefferson, she said. You matter to me. He looked up at the ceiling, not seeing it. Jefferson? Chicken, dirt, it don't matter, he said. Yeah, it do, Jefferson, yeah, it do. Dirt? All the same, he said, it don't matter. My chicken? She said, I'm tasting it right now. She took a small bite. You always liked my chicken every Sunday. He was quiet. You like a yam? She asked him. He didn't answer her. You want a tea cake? You don't have to eat no chicken if you don't want. You don't have to eat no old yam either. But I know how much you like my tea cakes. I didn't bring no clabber, but Jefferson? When are you going to do it? Tomorrow? Do what, Jefferson? He was quiet, looking up at the ceiling, but not seeing it. What, Jefferson? He turned toward her. His body didn't turn, just his head turned a little. His eye did, eyes did most of the turning. He looked at her as though he did not know who she was or what she was doing there. Then he looked at me. You know what I'm talking about, don't you? His eyes said. They were big brown eyes, the whitish too, the whites too reddish. You know, don't you? His eyes said again. I looked back at him. My eyes would not dare answer him, but his eyes knew that my eyes knew. You with him? He asked me. With who? I said. His eyes mocked me. They were big brown eyes and the whites were too reddish. And he had been thinking too much the past few weeks and the eyes mocked me. You the one? He asked me. The one for what? I said. His big brown eyes with reddish whites mocked me. Going to jack that switch, he said, looking at me. What switch, Miss Emma said. He was looking at me, not at her. His eyes told me that I knew what switch he was talking about. That's Professor Wiggins, your teacher. What switch, she asked. He turned his head and began staring up at the ceiling again. The deputy came back and stood just outside the cell. Miss Emma sat still on the bunk, but now Jefferson had turned his back to her and was facing the gray concrete wall. Miss Emma passed her hand over his hair again. Then she pushed herself up from the bunk. I'm leaving, Jefferson, she said. I'll come back soon. The deputy opened the cell door to let us out. Can I leave the food? Miss Emma asked him. Sure, the deputy said. If you don't eat it all, you can give it to the rest of them children. Sure, the deputy said. He locked the cell door. I'm leaving, Jefferson, Miss Emma said, looking back into the cell. He faced the gray concrete wall and didn't answer her. Oh, Lord Jesus, she cried. Oh, Lord Jesus, stand by, stand by. The deputy and I exchanged glances. With his eyes and a nod, he told me to put my arms around her, which I did. Chapter 10 our next two visits went pretty much as the first one did. I picked up Miss Emma at her house at around 1.30. My aunt was always there with her, and after she had settled down into the back seat of the car, we drove in silence all the way into Bayoni. Each time we arrived five or ten minutes before the hour, the food was searched, 
I was asked to take everything out of my pockets, then told to put everything back into my pockets, and we were led down the narrow, dark wood corridor, passing opened office doors where white men and white women carried on their daily routines. The deputy walked ahead of us, with Miss Emma directly behind him and me beside her. At the end of the corridor, we would climb the steps to the first landing, where the deputy would wait a minute to allow Miss Emma to catch her breath. Then we would continue up to the next floor and through the heavy steel door to the cell block. The prisoners would hear us coming and they would stand at the cell doors with their hands stuck out between the bars. As she had done the first time, Miss Emma promised that they could have the food Jefferson did not eat. As I had done the first time, I gave them the change I had in my pockets, which was always less than a dollar. Then we would move down the line to the last cell. Jefferson always lay on the bunk, either looking at the ceiling or facing the wall. Each time the deputy opened the door and locked us in. Jefferson had no more to talk about the second or third time than he did the first. And after we spent an hour with him, we were let out. Each time Miss Emma left the cell crying, and both times she told the young deputy to give the food to the other children. On Friday, our fourth visit, I left Irene Cole in charge of the school and instructed her to let the children go at three. If she felt they had done all their schoolwork before three, she could dismiss them early because it was getting colder and most of the children would have work to do at home. They had to go down to my aunt's house to get my car. Then I drove back up the quarter to Miss Emma's. Usually she was waiting for me, but not today. I sat out there in the car a good five minutes, but no, Miss Emma. I didn't want to blow the horn. I thought that might show impatience and disrespect, but still, no, Miss Emma. The door was shut, and the only thing to give the place any sign of life was a trickle of white smoke rising occasionally out of the chimney. After sitting out there another couple of minutes, I put patience and respect aside. I pressed on the horn hard and long enough for everyone in the quarter to hear it. I had given up my class to take her to Bayoni, and she was not ready, and I wanted them all to know about it. Finally, the door did open. My aunt came out on the porch and pushed the door shut behind her. She stood there watching me. I knew that stand. I knew that look. I knew that she was not coming one step further and that I would have to come to her. She still watched me as I got out of the car and came up the walk. I stopped short of the porch. Something wrong with you? She asked me. I wanted to ask that same question about Miss Emma, but I held my tongue. Don't you know if she was able, she would be out here? Then why didn't she tell me she wasn't going? I could be teaching my class. Nobody said you wasn't going. You're saying I'm supposed to visit him alone? He's no kin. Come on in here, boy, and get that bag, my aunt said. She watched me come up the porch and go by her. Then she followed me into the house. Miss Emma was sitting at the fireplace in a rocking chair. She had on two sweaters, a black one over a green one. She had some kind of rag, possibly a baby's diaper tied around her head. I stood in the center of the room near the hanging light bulb. I had the feeling that Miss Emma was not nearly as sick as she pretended to be. For one thing, I had seen her that morning picking up chips in the yard, and she didn't look sick at all. And now I could smell fried chicken and baked potato, and I knew she could not have done all that if she was dying. My aunt sat down in the rocker next to Miss Emma's. Now both of them peered into the fireplace at the two half-burned logs that gave about as much fire as a candle would. Neither said a thing as if they were sitting alone in deep thought. Then Miss Emma coughed twice, short and dry, to let me know that she was on her deathbed. Then a silence again. There was smoke in the room, and I must have cleared my throat or something, because my aunt used that moment to speak. That food waiting, I didn't know where the food was waiting for me. I didn't look for it. I just stood back looking at them. He don't have to go, Miss Emma said. She coughed again, 
reminding me that she was still on her deathbed. Not if it's going to be a burden. My aunt looked back at me. I said that food waiting. Miss Emma's dying, but you can go with me, I said. I don't have on my good dress, my aunt said. I can wait, I said. No, you won't, she said. Don't force him, Miss Emma said. When I'm able to get on my feet, God willing, I'll get somebody else to take me up there. I don't want to be a burden on nobody. As I stood there listening to her, I realized that this had been planned from the beginning. All that other stuff I went through was to lead up to this day. Going up to Pichot's house, meeting the sheriff, the three visits to the jail with her, all that was nothing but preparation for the today. Didn't she say it that first night at Pichot's? I'm old. My heart won't take it. I want somebody else to take my place. Didn't she say it? Sure she did, because it was planned even then. But she had had help. My aunt. She coughed again, quick, dry, faked as before. I told myself that what she needed was more wood on the fire. I went to the corner of the room where the wood was stacked, and I piled as many logs on my arms as I could stand up with. Then I threw them all into the fireplace. Sparks of fire shot across the hearth into the room, and smoke and ashes shot up the chimney. I brushed off my clothes and stood there until the wood had started burning. Can I do anything else, Miss Emma? I said. Maybe some cough syrup? You can watch your tongue, sir, my aunt said. I just want Miss Emma to get better, I said. He don't have to go, Miss Emma said. He's going, my aunt said. If it's a burden, Miss Emma said. Maybe I'll go halfway, I said. Maybe I'll dump the food out there in the river. Fishes don't get much to eat in winter. Maybe they like fried chicken. You better get that food and get out of here if you know what's good for you, my aunt said. I went back into the kitchen and snatched the bag off the table. There was enough food in it to feed everybody in the jail. Everything you sent me to school for, you're stripping me of it, I told my aunt. They were looking at the fire and I stood behind them with the bag of food. The humiliation I had to go through going into that man's kitchen. The hours I had to wait while they ate and drank and socialized before they would even see me. Now going up to that jail to watch them put their dirty hands on that food to search my body each time as if I'm some kind of common criminal. Maybe today they'll want to look into my mouth or my nostrils or make me strip. Anything to humiliate me. All the things you wanted me to escape by going to school. Years ago, Professor Antoine told me that if I stayed here, they were going to break me down to that blank I was born to be. But he didn't tell me that my aunt would help them do it. She got up slowly, heavily, and went to Miss Emma, who had begun to shake her head and cry. Miss Emma sincerely did not want me to go now, but my aunt had not changed her mind for a moment. I'm sorry, Mr. Grant. I'm helping them white people to humiliate you. I'm so sorry. And I wished they had somebody else we could turn to. But they ain't nobody else. Chapter 11 The sheriff was in his office when I came into the courthouse. I could see him behind his desk, talking to another man who had just opened the door to leave. They talked a while longer. Then the man came out into the corridor. I caught the door and went into the office with the bag of food. Help you? Guidry asked me. He sat with his cowboy boots propped up on the desk. He wore an open-collared light gray shirt and dark gray pants. His necktie, his cowboy hat, and his coat hung on a rack by the file cabinet next to his desk. This was the first time he had been in his office since I started coming up there, but I didn't doubt that he knew who I was. I came to see Jefferson, I said. How are y'all getting along? This will be my first time alone with him. What's in the basket? Food his nanan sent him. Paul? Guidry called while still looking at me. The young deputy came into the office from a side door. Called, Sheriff? Guidry nodded toward me. How you doing? The deputy asked. Fine. And yourself? I can't complain, he said. 
We went through the usual routine. I had to take everything out of my pockets and put it all back. The deputy went through all the food, unwrapping one piece of chicken, checking it, putting it back. He unwrapped two or three pieces of candy, checked out the bag of sweet potatoes. Then, finished, he wiped his hands on a pocket handkerchief. Still think you can get something into that head of his? Guidry spoke across the tips of those cowboy boots. I don't know, sir. Just remember what I said, Guidry said. Any sign of aggravation, I'll stop all this. I nodded my head. Then I remembered that I had to speak out. Yes, sir. He looked at me a while, then he nodded to the deputy, and we left the office. Since Miss Emma was not with us this time, I walked beside the deputy instead of behind him. We went by all the familiar open doors where people pecked on typewriters. We climbed the familiar stairs up, the big, up to the big steel door that led onto the cell block. By now, I could probably have done this with my eyes shut. The prisoners came to the cell doors as before. If they were not the same ones, they were the same ages in their late teens or early 20s. I gave them the change I had. Nobody got more than a dime. Two could put their money together and get a pack of cigarettes, or one could get a pack of gum and a candy bar. Jefferson sat on his bunk with his head bowed and his arms hanging down between his legs. The deputy opened the door for me to go in, and he reminded me that he would be back within the hour. In case I wanted to leave before then, I could call a trustee, and the trustee would come to get him. Jefferson, I said. He didn't look up. Your nana couldn't make it today, I said. She has a bad cold, but she sent you something. How are you feeling, Jefferson? After a while, he raised his head, but he didn't look at me. He looked at the barred window. From the cell, all you could see were the yellow leaves on the sycamore tree and the pale blue sky between the leaves. You hungry? I asked. You brought some corn? He said. Corn? That's what hogs eat, he said, turning his head now to look at me. He had not washed his face or combed his hair for days. He wore one of my old khaki shirts and a wrinkled pair of brown pants. He didn't have on shoes. They were stuck under the bunk. I didn't bring any corn, I said, and you're not a hog. He looked at me as if I was patronizing him. When was the last time you ate, I asked him. I don't know. Today, I asked him. I don't know. He was playing with me, and I knew it. Some chicken in there, I said. Biscuits and sweet potatoes. Even some candy she made. You ought to try it. It'll make her happy. Hogs don't eat no candy, he said. You're not a hog, I said. You're a man. He grunted deep in his throat and grinned at me. Mind if I have a piece of your chicken? I asked him. I left before dinner. He acted as though he had not heard me. Since the deputy had already gone through the paper bag, I did not have to do too much unwrapping to get to the food. I took out a drumstick and a biscuit and started eating. Your nan and sure can cook, I said. That's for you, for humans, he said. You're a human being, Jefferson, I said. I'm an old hog, he said. Humans don't stay in no stall like this. I'm an old hog they fatten enough to kill. That would hurt your nana if she heard you say that. You want to tell me you said that? Old hog don't care what people say. She cares, I said, and I do too, Jefferson. Y'all humans, he said. You're a human being too, Jefferson. I'm an old hog, he said, more to himself than to me. Just an old hog they fattening up to kill for Christmas. You're a human being, Jefferson. You're a man. He kept his eyes on me as he got up from the bunk. I'm going to show you how a old hog eat, he said. He knelt down on the floor and put his head inside the bag and started eating without using his hands. He even sounded like a hog. I stood back watching him while I continued to eat the biscuit and a piece of chicken. That's how a old hog eat, he said, rising his head and grinning at me. He got up from his knees and went back to his bunk. That's how a old hog eat. All right, I said. But when I go back, I'm going to tell her that you said 
that you and I sat on the bunk and ate and you said how good the food was. I won't tell her what you did. She's already sick and that would kill her. So I'm going to lie. I'm going to tell her how much you like the food, especially the pralines. He said nothing. He just grinned at me. Are you trying to hurt me, Jefferson? I asked him. Are you trying to make me feel guilty for your being here? You don't want me to come back here anymore? His expression didn't change as though someone had chiseled that painful, cynical grin on his face. That man out there doesn't want me up here either, I told him. He said, I will never be able to make you understand anything. He said, I'm just wasting my time coming up here now. But your nanan doesn't think so. She wants me to come up here. She wants us to talk. What do you want? You want me to stay away and let them win? The white man? You want him to win? His expression remained the same. Cynical, defiant, painful. I could not think of anything else to say to him. But since I had been there less than half an hour, I knew it was too early to call for the deputy. The sheriff would have known that Jefferson and I were not getting along, and that was the last thing I could afford, at least for Miss Emma's sake. The rest of the hour just dragged along. Jefferson was not looking at me anymore. He had lain back down on the bunk facing the wall. I gazed out the window at the yellow leaves on the sycamore tree. The leaves were as still as if they were painted there. Between the leaves, I could see bits of pale blue sky. I looked at Jefferson with his back to me. I looked at his pair of laceless shoes under the bunk. I looked down at the bag of food, trying to remember how many pieces of chicken, biscuits, potatoes, or pieces of candy were still in there. I went to the wash bowl and got a handful of water to drink. I tried turning the faucet off completely, but it continued to drip. The water had left a brown stain from the top of the bowl to the drain. I turned to Jefferson again. He was facing the wall, his back to me. I wanted to ask him what he was thinking about. When I heard the deputy come down the cell block, I went to the bunk. Anything you want me to tell your nanan? I asked him. He didn't answer. His eyes were open and staring at the wall. I'll tell her how much you enjoyed the food, I said. That would make her happy. The deputy came up to the cell and let me out. Y'all doing all right? He asked as we walked away. He was glad to get some home cooking, I said. I can't blame him for that, the deputy said. Chapter 12 I knew Miss Emma expected me to come back and tell her all about Jefferson, but I had not thought of a good lie yet. I couldn't go there and tell her what had really happened. That would have hurt too much. I couldn't go there and say that we had had a good talk. She probably wouldn't have believed it. Not after the way he had acted when we were there all together. I needed time to think, to think of something. Not a big lie, just a little lie or a number of little lies, but a lie it had to be. Maybe I could tell her he was concerned about her health. She would like that. Maybe I could tell her he had begun to use the brush and comb I had bought for him. Or maybe I could say that the deputy had told me what a good prisoner he was and that the sheriff himself had said he was a good boy. I needed time, time to get my lies straight. And the best place for that was at the Rainbow. I got into my car and drove back of town. The Rainbow Club was quiet, dark and quiet. There were only two old men in the place besides Joe Claiborne, who was behind the bar. All three stood talking baseball. Jackie Robinson. Robinson had just finished his second year with the Brooklyn Dodgers. What's happening, Prof? Claiborne said to me. Hey, Jax, I said. He brought the bottle of beer to me. A little business in town, I said. Claiborne could see that I didn't want to talk about the business, or maybe he realized what the business was. He nodded his head and went back down the bar where the other customers were. The two old men had continued their conversation, and Claiborne joined them again as if he had never left. From where I stood, about halfway down the bar, all I could hear was Jackie this and Jackie that. Nothing about any of the other players. 
nothing about the Brooklyn Dodgers as a team. Only Jackie. Jackie this and Jackie that. I sipped my beer slowly while listening to them, and they were very good. They could recall everything Jackie had done in the past two years. They remembered when he got his first hit and who it was against. They remembered the first time he stole two bases in one game and the first time he stole home. One of the men backed away from the bar to demonstrate how slow the pitcher was in throwing the ball, which gave Jackie the opportunity to steal home plate. The old man looked over each shoulder, as pitchers do when there are runners on bases. He raised his leg as high as he could, which was only about a foot off the floor, to show how much time the pitcher took to throw the ball to the plate. While the pitcher went through the motion of raising his leg and winding his arm, Jackie was on his way home. Now the old man became Jackie, not running, but showing the motion of someone running at full speed. His arms were doing what the legs could not do. He showed you the motion of Jackie sliding into the plate, the motion of the umpire calling Jackie safe, and the motion of Jackie brushing off his clothes and going into the dugout. The old man nodded his head emphatically with great pride and went back to the bar. Claiborne and the other old man told him that he was exactly right. Listening to them, I could remember back to the time before Jackie came to the major leagues when it was Joe Lewis that everyone talked about. Yes, I could remember. I could remember when he was the only one, especially the big fight which smelling that German I could still remember how depressed everyone was after Joe had lost the first fight with Schmeling. For weeks it was like that. To be caught laughing for any reason seemed like a sin. This was a period of mourning. What else in the world was there to be proud of if Joe had lost? Even the preacher got into it. Let us wait. Let us wait, children. David will meet Goliath again. And everyone told everyone else. They go and meet again. Just wait. And we waited and waited. And finally, the big fight did come. There were two radios in the quarter. One at the Williams house down the quarter. Another at the McVeigh's up the quarter. I was down the quarter. I was 17 then. I was not the youngest, nor surely the oldest. I was just one. Praying and hoping for the only hero we knew. There was much noise much talking while the people waited for the fight to begin. Once the announcer said that the fighters were in the ring, everyone became silent without anybody having to tell them to do so. There were small children there too, but even they had quit playing and were silent. We held our breath, remembering the first fight. Could God let it happen again? Would he let it happen again? Then it was over, and there was nothing but chaos. People screamed as some shot pistols in the air. There were mock fights. Old men fell down on the floor as Schmeling did and had to be helped up. Everybody laughed. Everybody patted everybody else on the back. For days after the fight, for weeks we held our heads higher than any people on earth had ever done for any reason. I was only 17 then, but I could remember it, every bit of it. The warm evening, the people... The noise, the pride I saw in those faces. Now, while I stood there listening to the old man in their praise of Jackie Robinson, I remembered something else. The little Irishman. I was at the university then. The little Irishman was given a series of lectures at white universities. But some way or another, our university got him to visit us. How? Only God knows but we were all gathered in the auditorium. And there stood this little white man with the thick accent talking to us about Irish literature. He spoke of Yeats, O'Casey, Joyce, names I never heard before. I sat there listening, listening, trying to remember everything he said. And a name he repeated over and over was Parnell. And he told us how some Irishmen would weep this day at the mention of the name Parnell. Parnell, Parnell, Parnell. Then he spoke of James Joyce. He told about Joyce's family, his religion, his education, his writing. He spoke of a book called Dubliners and a story in the book entitled Ivy Day in the Committee Room. 
Regardless of race, regardless of class, this, that story was universal, he said. For days after the lecture, I tried to find that book, but it was not in our library and not in any of the bookstores. I went to Mr. Anderson, my literature teacher, and asked him if he knew how I could get a copy. He said he could see what he could do. A week later, he kept me after class and handed me a collection of stories. It was not Joyce's Dubliners, but an anthology of short stories, with Ivy Day in the committee room included as one of them. Mr. Anderson had gotten a professor at the White University to check the book out of his library for him. He's a pretty decent fellow, Mr. Anderson said about the white professor. Some of them are, you know, and always remember that. I'll take care of that book. You can keep it a week, and it had better come back to me in the same condition in which it left. You understand me, don't you, Wiggins? I read the story and reread the story, but I still could not find the universality that the little Irishman had spoke of. All I saw in the story was some Irishman meeting in a room and talking politics. What had that to do with America, especially with my people? It was not until years later that I saw what he meant. I had gone to bars, to barber shops. I had stood on street corners. I had gone to many suppers there in the quarter. But I had never really listened to what was being said. Then I began to listen to listen closely to how they talked about their heroes, how they talked about the dead and about how great the dead had once been. I heard it everywhere. The old men down at the end of the bar were still talking about Jackie Robinson, but I was not thinking about Jackie now or Joe Lewis or the little Irishman. I was thinking about that cold, depressing cell uptown. I raised my hand for Claiborne to bring me another beer. He gave me the bottle and looked into my eyes, and he could tell that I didn't feel like talking. So he went back down the bar to where the old men were still talking baseball. I didn't want to think about that cell uptown. I didn't even want to think about Miss Emma and the lies I had to tell her. I wanted to think about more pleasant things. I thought about Vivian. Now, there was not a more pleasant thing in the world to think about. Today was Friday, wasn't it? And wouldn't it be nice if the two of us could go somewhere and spend the entire weekend? Wouldn't that be nice? I would be able to forget the whole thing, the whole thing for at least a couple of days. Darn it, it would be so good if we could go away and never come back. I knew I could find a job doing something else, and so could she. If we could just get the heck away from here, just go away. The old men down the bar continued to hit the ball, throw the ball, and slide into bases. And my mind went back to that cell uptown, then to another cell somewhere in Florida. After reading about the execution there, I had dreamed about it over and over and over. As vividly as if I were there, I had seen that cell, heard that boy crying while being dragged to that chair. Please, Joe Lewis, help me. Please help me, help me. And after he had been strapped in the chair, the man who wrote the story could still hear him cry, Mr. Joe Lewis, help me. Mr. Joe Lewis, help me. And down the bar, the old men went on hitting the ball, running the bases and sliding home. And I wondered if the one in that cell uptown would call on Jackie Robinson as the other one had called on Joe Lewis. Taking off, Prof? Claiborne asked me. I have to find my lady, I said. Take it easy, Prof. I waved my hand to the old men. They nodded to me. The school was three or four blocks away on the main street, but everything back here was pretty close to everything else. The school was on the same street as the Catholic Church, the movie theater, the mortuary, a cafe, and the ice cream parlor. The grocery store was not far from the church, but on another street. The barber shop and a gas station weren't too far from the mortuary. Everybody knew everybody. Everybody knew everybody else's business. I parked in front of the movie theater and watched one of the teachers direct the children onto the school bus. When the bus drove away, I got out of my car. What's happening, handsome? The teacher said. What's going on, Peggy? 
Thank God it's Friday, she said. She's still inside. Having a drink later? A couple, Peggy said. As we walked up to the entrance of the school, I saw two boys taking in the flag. Peggy told me she would see us at the club later, and I went to Vivian's classroom. The school had only five rooms, and in some of the classes were doubled. Vivian taught the sixth and seventh grades. The children had all gone, and she sat behind her desk looking over papers. She wore a brown woolen suit and a white blouse. She didn't raise her head until I was near the desk. Then she smiled. She had the most beautiful and most even teeth I had ever seen. But I thought every bit of her was perfect. What are you doing here? She asked. You ever known a Friday I couldn't stay away from you? I went around the desk and kissed her. Last boy stood at this desk wouldn't dare do that, she said. I better not ever catch anyone else doing it, I said. What are you doing here? She asked. To see you. What else? She looked up at me and she could read in my face and she knew that I had been at the jail. Still working? I asked. Nothing I can't do later. I saw Peggy. They were going over for a drink. Sounds like a good idea, Vivian said. She put some papers into a briefcase and stood up. I have to see the principal before she leaves. Do you know how to clean a blackboard? I've done a few. If you do a good job, I'll give you an apple, she said. Thanks, teacher. She kissed me lightly on the lips and walked away. At the door, she looked back and smiled again. A vertical line had been drawn down the blackboard. On one side of the line were French sentences. On the other side, English translations. They were simple sentences. Where is the book? Where is the tablet? Where is the pencil? I wiped both halves clean, but you could still see the imprint of the sentences. I drew another vertical line, and on one side I wrote, Je t'aime, je t'aime, je t'aime. And on the other side I wrote, I love you, I love you, I love you. Vivian came back into the room and saw what I had done. You naughty boy, she said. Suppose Daisy sees that. Doesn't she already know? I ought to make you stand in the corner on one foot. If you stood there with me, I wouldn't mind. Naughty boy, naughty boy, she said. Erase that. Only if you kiss me first. She had picked up the briefcase, and I took it from her and laid it on the desk and pulled her into my arms. Let's go somewhere, just the two of us, I said after kissing her. Let's go somewhere and spend the night. Baton Rouge, New Orleans, anywhere. My babies, she said. Dora will look after them. Come on, let's go somewhere. We're having a drink with Peggy, remember? Let's forget Peggy and everybody else. Let's go somewhere. I could see that for a moment she was thinking about it. Then she shook her head. No, she said, I can't take that chance. Don't you want to? More than anything. Then let's take the chance. No, she said, I can't give him an excuse to take my babies. You think he would? I don't know. I can't take that risk. I hate going to Robert and Helen's, then leaving in the middle of the night. I hate it too, she said, but staying overnight somewhere, I can't take that chance. Where is he now? Last I heard in Houston. When's he coming back? I don't know. Until he makes up his mind, we just do nothing. I thought we did a lot. You know what I mean. Come on, let's go find Peggy and them and have a drink. Not till I get another kiss. What is the matter, she said, after we had kissed. Maybe it was the way I had held her. Maybe it was the look in my face. I told her what happened at the jail, how Jefferson had gotten down on his knees to eat the food out of the paper bag. I saw her frown, and she brought her hand up to her mouth. I have to go back to that old woman, but I couldn't go back then. I couldn't face her then. I needed some time to think of a lie to tell her. With her hand still over her mouth, Vivian was looking at me. I wish I could just run away from this place. Vivian shook her head. You know you can't. Why not? For the same reason you haven't done it yet. I wanted to. But you haven't. Why? 
You know the answer yourself, Grant. You love them more than you hate this place. Is it love or cowardice? Afraid to take a chance out there? You have folks in California. You can always go to them. I've thought about it many times. Sure, she said. You even did it once, but you came back. This is all we have, Grant. I want more. I turned away from her and erased the blackboard. Well, let's go have that drink, I said. Wait, Vivian said. She went up to the board and wrote in large letters. Jete amers toujours, jete amers toujours, jete amers toujours. And suppose old Daisy comes here before you get back on Monday. She already knows about it, Vivian said. So do all the rest, teachers and students. Chapter 13. Not long after the second bell rang at the church, I heard Miss Eloise boy out in the road calling my aunt. I went onto the porch and told her that my aunt was in the back. Miss Eloise, tall and thin, stood in the road, leaning on her bamboo walking stick. She wore a long black overcoat and a black hat with a white band. She was looking up the quarter. She said she thought there was a new chill in the air, and I agreed with her. While she waited for my aunt, she continued to look up the quarter toward the church. I didn't feel like standing out on the porch, but I thought it would be rude to go inside and leave her in the road with no one to talk to. I heard my aunt come into the house from the backyard. She was in her room only a moment before she walked out on the porch. She wore the black coat over a black dress, white stockings, and low-heeled black shoes. Hey there, Ello, she called. Hey, Miss Eloise, called back. She really stretched it out. Hey, ain't been waiting too long, I hope, my aunt said. Just getting here, Miss Eloise said. Be sure you shut them doors if you leave from here, my aunt said to me. She was already halfway down the steps when she said it. She had not looked at me. Years ago, she had quit looking at me when she was on her way to church. When I came back from the university, I told her that I didn't believe anymore and I didn't want her to try forcing it on me. If she did, I told her that I would have to look for some other place to live. She didn't want me to leave, so she let me alone. Only occasionally, when she had some other church member at the house, would she bring it up. Even then, she wouldn't press it too far. She and Miss Eloise started up the quarter, one tall and slim, the other short and much heavier. They stopped in front of Miss Emma's house, and I heard my aunt calling her, Emma! Hey, there, Emma! Miss Emma came out of the house, and the three of them continued up to the church together. I went back inside. I had started correcting papers a couple of hours earlier, but I hadn't done very much. On Sunday, my aunt began getting ready for church as soon as she woke up, which was around 6 o'clock. Until 11 o'clock, there was nothing I could do but listen to her singing her termination song. Determination Sunday was the third Sunday of each month when members of the church would stand and sing their favorite hymns and tell the congregation where they were determined to spend eternity. My aunt started warming up at six in the morning, whether it was Termination Sunday or not, and didn't quit until eleven when she walked out of the house. So I would be forced to put away the work until after she had gone, or I would go for a walk through the quarter and back into the field. I sat at my table trying to correct papers, but my mind kept drifting back to Friday. It had been dark when I returned to the quarter from Bayani. It was colder, too. I could see sparks of fire rising out of chimneys when I stopped in front of Miss Emma's house. Pharrell Giraud, who lived across the road, told me she had gone to my aunt's house. She said good night to him and went down the quarter. I recognized Reverend Ambrose's car parked before the door. Now I felt a little guilty for getting back so late. The three of them were in the kitchen drinking coffee, Reverend Ambrose, Miss Emma, and my aunt. They were quiet, sitting in semi-darkness. The only light in the kitchen came from the open door of the stove. No one looked around when I came in, and Reverend Ambrose and Miss Emma barely answered when I spoke their names. 
My aunt was completely silent. I went to the ice box and took out the pitcher of water. And while I poured a glass full, I looked at the three of them at the table. They were quiet, not even drinking their coffee now. I'll be in my room, I said to my aunt. That's all you got to say? She snapped at me. I spoke, Tantaloo. You know what I'm talking about. He was all right, I said. That's all, my aunt said. Or did you forget to go? I went and he was all right, I said. You got more than that to say, Mr. Man, my aunt said. Folks been sitting here hours waiting for you. I see you recovered from your cold, Miss Emma. I'm glad it wasn't to sit down, my aunt said. I went around the table and pulled out the fourth chair. He was all right, I said. My aunt looked at me. Reverend Ambrose and Miss Emma stared out into the yard. That's not what she want to hear, my aunt said. How he was when you got there, how he was when you left. He was all right both times, I said. You know what I'm talking about, my aunt said. She looked at me the way an inquisitor must have glared at his poor victims. The only reason she didn't put me on the rack was that she didn't have one. We both ate some of the food and we talked, I said. All this time, Miss Emma had been gazing into the yard. Now she looked at me, no, toward me. Her thoughts were far distant. He et? Some, I said. Y'all talked? Her mind was still far away. A little, I said. Now her focus became closer, much closer. She was looking at me now. What y'all talk about? Different things. I told him you didn't come to see him because you had a bad cold. She looked at me waiting to hear his answer, but I couldn't think of another lie, so I shifted to something else. Then I asked him how he was getting along. He said he was all right. The deputy had already told me he was okay. Guidry was in the office today. He said that Jefferson was getting along fine, didn't cause any trouble. He is using that comb and brush I bought for him. He was wearing one of my shirts, the khaki one. I think he's doing okay. Miss Emma and my aunt both studied me. Miss Emma wanted to believe what I was saying, but I could see she had doubts. My aunt still wanted to put me on the rack, and Reverend Ambrose continued to look out into the darkness. What else y'all talked about, my aunt said. You left from here for one thirty. I can't remember everything we talked about, I said. We just talked. More than five hours? You can't remember nothing else? I was with him about an hour. Then I went back a town. I have a girl back a town. I like to see her sometime. And maybe that's where you spent all your time. If you don't think I went to the jail, you can always go up there and ask them. I didn't ask for none of your uppity, mister. I don't mean to be uppity, I told her. I'm just telling you the truth. I spent an hour with him. I had a drumstick and a biscuit, and he had something. I can't remember exactly what it was. Then we talked. Then I left and went back to town. Exactly what I did. Deep in you, what do you think? Reverend Ambrose suddenly turned from looking out into the darkness. Deep in you? About what, Reverend? Him. What's he thinking? What's he thinking deep in him? Deep in you, what do you think? Who knows what somebody else is thinking? They say one thing, they may be thinking about something else. Who can tell? You the teacher, my aunt said, not so kindly. Deep in you, Reverend Ambrose said. Deep in you, you think he know? He done grasp the significance of what it's all about? Deep in you? The significance? The gravity? The gravity? Reverend Mose Ambrose was a short, very dark man whose face and bald head were always shining. He was the plantation church's pastor. He was not educated, hadn't gone to any theological school. He had heard the voice and started preaching. He was a simple, devoted believer. He christened babies, baptized youth, visited those who were ill, counseled those who had trouble, preached and buried the dead. All these things could be simply accomplished. But when it came to a discussion with a teacher, though he had known that teacher since his birth, 
Then suddenly things were not so simple. His soul, he said. I don't know anything about the soul, Reverend Ambrose. I baptized him, Reverend Ambrose said. He was 11 or 12 then, but like so many others, he didn't keep the faith either, like yourself. He stared at me as though I was one of the worst of sinners. Maybe I was. Backsliders were usually worse than those who had never been converted. At least that is what people like him tried to make you believe. Y'all talked about God? He asked me. No, sir, we didn't get around to that. Didn't get around to God? No, sir. He looked at me and nodded his head. If we didn't talk about God, then what else on earth was important enough to talk about to someone who was about to meet God? I figured that's where you came in, Reverend. There's enough room for both of us, I can tell you that. Me, Sister Emma, Sister Lou going up there Monday, he said. Anything I ought to take him? Food, I suppose. Maybe some clean clothes can't think anything else. I was thinking more about the Bible, Reverend Ambrose said. That would be nice too, I said. Reverend Ambrose did not have any more to say. He and my aunt continued to stare at me until I excused myself and left the table. Now on Sunday, as I sat at the table trying to do my work, I could hear them singing in church. It seemed that I had listened to this singing and their praying every Sunday of my life. No, I had done more than just listen. I participated until my last year at the university. There was no one thing that changed my faith. I suppose it was a combination of many things. But mostly it was just plain studying. I did not have time for anything else. Many times I would not come home on weekends, and when I did, I found that I cared less and less about the church. Of course, it pained my aunt to see this change in me, and it saddened me to see the pain I was causing her. I thought many times about leaving, as Professor Antoine had advised me to do. My mother and father also told me that if I was not happy in Louisiana, I should come to California. After visiting them the summer following my junior year at the university, I came back, which pleased my aunt. But I had been running in place ever since, unable to accept what used to be my life, unable to leave it. I pushed away the papers and listened to the singing. Miss Eloise was singing her termination song. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? You could hear that high, shrill voice all over the plantation. I had been hearing it all my life, all my life. After her, there would be someone else, then someone else. It would go on for three or four hours. And it was impossible to do anything but listen to it or leave. I thought I heard a car stop before the door, but I didn't leave the table. Then I thought I heard someone come onto the porch. And when I looked up, I saw her standing in the doorway. But I did not believe it was she because she had never come here before. She wore a blue blazer and a maroon pleated skirt. A black patent leather purse hung from her right shoulder. I hope you don't mind. Only if I'm dreaming, she smiled and came into the room. Chapter 14 I finished all my work. I wanted to see you, Vivian said. I had already stood up. I moved around the table and kissed her. I couldn't have wished for anything more. Why today? I don't know, she said. I just missed you. I wanted to see you. Where are the children? Dora, she said. I hope I'm not keeping you from anything. Only from a boring afternoon. Vivian smiled and looked around the room. Not much to look at, I said, apologizing for the place. This had been my parents' room before they went to California during the war. There was a bed, a chiffre robe, a washstand, a table, and a couple of chairs. All the furniture was old. On the mantelpiece were three pictures in five by seven wood frames. One of Vivian and me, one of my mother, and one of my father. A photo collage of Frederick Douglass, Abraham Lincoln, and Booker T. Washington hung over the mantel. Several pictures from calendars over the past few years were tacked to the wall. The wallpaper had brown, red, and green squares, and in places it was torn from age. Vivian picked up the picture of my mother. 
Mom? She said. Yes. Pretty. What about, about your complexion? Very fair. She replaced the picture and took up my father's. Dark and handsome, she said. I suppose you could say that. I don't know those other two, she said, looking at our picture. She looked around the room. I love it. Rustic. It's rustic, all right. Probably the most rustic place you will ever visit. Pastoral, she said. That, too, I said, with the singing and praying up at the church, really pastoral. I like it, she said. Try staying here about a year. She had gone to the window, and she was looking across the vegetable garden toward the church up the quarter. I moved behind her and put my arms around her waist, and I could smell her perfume. She turned to me, and I brought my hands up to her face and held it a moment while we looked at each other. Then I kissed her, kissed her very tenderly, and when I looked at her again, I can see in her face that she loved me as much as I loved her. I'm sorry, I don't have anything here to drink, I said. Don't worry about that. Would you like to eat something? My aunt made a cake. I had a good breakfast, Vivian said. What about coffee? Don't bother. It's already made. Okay. We went through my aunt's room, which was even more rustic than mine, then into the kitchen. In the kitchen was a black four-lid wood stove, a five-foot-tall white ice box, a handmade table with four wood bottom chairs around it, a safe with screen doors for the dishes, a broom that had seen better days, an axe in the corner, and several black pots and aluminum pans hanging from nails on the wall. Very, very rustic. Vivian stood at the back door, looking across the yard toward the field where some of the cane had been cut. The cane had not been hauled to the derrick yet. It was lying across the rows. A little farther over, where another patch of cane was standing, tall and blue-green, you could see the leaves swaying softly from a breeze. After warming the coffee, I poured each of us a cupful. I cut two slices from the chocolate cake my aunt had in the safe. Then we sat down at the table, facing the yard and the field. It's really peaceful, Vivian said. Sunday is the saddest day of the week. Not for those who have to work in the field. It has always been for me. You ought to find something to do on Sunday, like going to church. I didn't answer her. I know you believe, she said. You don't want to, but I know you do. The only thing I believe in is loving you. We finished our cake and coffee, and I put the cups and saucers in the pan of soap water on the window shelf. We ought to wash them, Vivian said. They're okay. No, she said, it's not fair to her. You wash, I'll dry. It's going to be like that, huh? Uh-huh, she said. There was hot water in the kettle on the stove, and I poured some into the dishpan. Vivian had already taken down another pan from the wall, and I poured the rest of the hot water into it. She added cold water from the faucet by the ice box. I washed and rinsed the dishes. She dried them and put them into the safe. It felt good doing this with her. Is that enough? I asked when we had finished. Or do you want me to sweep out the kitchen and mop too? She looked down at the floor. I don't think so, she said. It looks pretty clean. We had been playing. Now I became serious. How long can you stay? I have some time. Would you like to go for a walk down the quarter? She nodded. But first I must go back to your little girl's house. I nodded toward the toilet, which was set on the ditch near the cane field. She left the kitchen, and I went to my room and put on a warmer shirt. I also got my knife in case we wanted a piece of sugar cane. I was standing on the porch when she came in from the back. Rustic enough out there for you? I've been in wars. I'm a country girl, remember? We left the house. Up at the church, Reverend Ambrose had just started his termination song, Amazing Grace. We went down the quarter. Most of the people who had not gone to church were indoors. Seldom was someone sitting out on the porch, and no one worked in the gardens or chopped wood in the yard. 
Horses and mules were grazing in the pastures beside and behind the houses, but that was about as much movement as you saw. Above, a low ashen sky loomed over the plantation, if not over the entire state of Louisiana. A swarm of blackbirds flew across the road and alighted in a pecan tree in one of the back yards to our left. The entire plantation was deadly quiet, except for the singing coming from the church up the quarter behind us. We crossed the railroad tracks and turned right. In front of us were three or four boxcars of sugar cane waiting to be picked up by a train and taken to the mill. We could also see the weighing scales left of the full boxcars and the derrick that lifted the cane from wagons and trailers and swung it onto the boxcars. Left of the weighing scales and the derrick was the plantation cemetery where my ancestors has, had been buried for the past century. The cemetery had lots of trees in it, pecans and oaks, and it was weedy too. Since there were so few gravestones, it was pretty hard to see many graves from the road. Just before we came up to the cemetery, we turned left on a road that would take us further into the field. This was Vivian's first time back here, and I told her that my people had worked these fields ever since slavery, and many of them were buried in the cemetery behind us. I asked her if she wanted a piece of cane, and she said yes. I jumped over the ditch and crossed a couple of rows until I found a good stock. Then I came back to where she was waiting for me. I cut off the first two joints and threw them away. They didn't look sweet enough. Then I peeled the third joint and tasted it. It was good. I cut off a round and gave it to Vivian. She chewed it and let some of the juice run down her chin, the way a small child would do. The small child would not have been able to help it, but she could. I cut off a round for myself and chewed it. It was very soft, very sweet. We chewed cane and walked the road for at least three quarters of a mile. Just before coming up to the gate that would lead into the swamp, I noticed a pecan tree to our right. I had picked pecans under that tree many times, and I suggested we go over there and see if we could find some. The tree stood at the headland of the cane field. We searched for pecans in the grass on the headland and down between the rows of cane. We found a couple of dozen big ones, big and soft-shelled, and I cracked them by squeezing two together. I gave Vivian one half and I kept the other. We sat under the tree and I cracked pecans for both of us. Suddenly we were too quiet. You want me here? Vivian asked. I was not looking at her when she said it and I could tell by her voice that she was not looking directly at me. Yes, I said. She had been gazing down at the ground. Now she raised her eyes to me. That's what I want too, she said. I love you, Vivian, I said. I want you to know that I love you very much. I hope you love me half as I, much as I love you. I left her for a while. When I come back, I saw that she had moved farther down between the rows where the cane would hide us better. She had taken everything off except her brassiere and slip. I took off everything except the heavy shirt, which I unbuttoned. Vivian raised her arms up and out to me as I lay down beside her. I lay on my side and touched her brown blank with my finger. Then I leaned over and kissed each tenderly and raised up and looked at her. She was smiling at me. I went back and I passed my tongue over each and I kissed each again and rubbed my chin over them. My beard must have been rough because I could feel her drawing away some. But when I looked at her, she was smiling again. I smiled back at her. I think something happened, she said. What do you mean? I have a strange feeling. I looked at her and I felt happy, but my face must have changed. What is the matter? She asked. Nothing. But you frowned. I'm happy. But you frowned when I said it. Maybe I was just thinking. I don't know if I want Paul to grow up here. Don't spoil it, she said. It's been too good. Don't spoil it. I'm sorry, sweetheart sweetheart and suppose it's molly no it's paul it could be molly molly wiggins i don't know if i like that name you think it's a good name molly wiggins it sounds okay 
Sounds kind of warish to me, Molly Wiggins. Then let her decide. If she likes it, we'll keep it. If she doesn't, we'll, we'll call her Paulette. Paul and Paulette. That sounds good. Maybe I'll have twins. If not, we'll go till there is a Paulette. She may be first. Then we'll go till there is Paul, I said. You ought to put on something. You might catch cold. Not if you hold me close. Not if you put that shirt round both of us. I lay upon her, kissing her hair, her eyes, her nose, her mouth. Chapter 15 Vivian stood with her back to me while I brushed off her blazer and her skirt. A few small blades of yellow grass clung to her hair. I removed them and picked up her purse, and I could see how clean the ground was where we had lain, and I could see where she had dug her heels into the ground. We left the field and started for the main road to return to the quarter. It had become colder, and we walked faster than we had when we had came out into the field. We start our Christmas program next week, Vivian said. It's about that time, huh? You're having a program, aren't you? I don't know. I hadn't given it much thought. You only have about a month. I guess I'll mention it to the children tomorrow. I'll see what they want. That stuff in bayani has been keeping me so busy I've just about forgotten everything else. When are you going to see him again? I don't know. His nan and my aunt and their pastor are going up there tomorrow. I'll probably go Friday. I don't know. You have any idea? She said, not looking at me directly. I thought I knew what she was talking about. It's up to the big boss in Baton Rouge, I said. Vivian was quiet. We crossed the railroad tracks and entered the quarter. People were leaving church and coming out into the road. You think your aunt has made it home? Vivian asked. She is usually the last one to leave. You want me to go before she gets home? I want you to stay. You think it'll be all right? She'll have to get used to it. I don't want to cause any trouble. There won't be any trouble, I said. We went over all that last Friday. What happened? She wanted to know what kept me in Bayani so long. I told her I had been with you. That's all. That's all. That's all. I want her to like me. She will when she gets to know you. I wish I could say the same for them in Free La Cove. Vivian had met and married a dark-skinned boy while attending Xavier University in New Orleans. She had not told her people about the wedding because she knew that they would be opposed to it. After she and the boy were married, she took him back to Free La Cove. Everything turned out just as she had feared. Her family had nothing to say to her husband and hardly anything to say to her. He never went back. When her first child was born, she took the baby to visit. No one held the child or gave it a present or any attention. That was three years ago, and she had not been home since, not even when the second child was born, nor when she separated from her husband. One of her sisters visited her sometimes, and occasionally a male cousin would see her in Bayani. Her mother and aunts wrote letters. There were no other communication. Vivian and I stood on the porch and watched my aunt, Miss Emma, Miss Eloise, and Inez come down the quarter. I saw my aunt looking at Vivian's little blue Chevrolet parked in front of the house, then looking toward the house. The women around her went on talking, but she was much more concerned with Vivian and me than with their conversation. They stopped before the house, and I saw Miss Eloise talking to my aunt. I am sure she was asking her whether they should come in or not. My aunt said yes, because they all proceeded into the yard, walking Indian file, my aunt in front. I introduced her to Vivian as soon as she came up the steps. Miss, my aunt said, and gave a slight nod. She didn't look at me. I introduced Vivian to the other women. How do you do, Miss Eloise? How are you? Miss Emma said. Glad to know you, Inez said but they were not glad to know her. They didn't feel comfortable at all. They were at my aunt's house, and they were not about to show much more enthusiasm than she had shown. They went inside in single file. You could smell their sweet powder all over the place. You think I ought to go? Vivian said. No, come on inside. We had to pass through my aunt's room to go back into the kitchen. 
Tante Lou and the other women had taken off their hats and coats and laid them, along with their pocketbooks, on the bed. They were in the kitchen sitting at the table. My aunt had brought them here for coffee and cake. I'll have to make some more coffee, I said. I'll make my own coffee, my aunt said. I'll make it, I said. Not here. Vivian and I drank the coffee and I'll make more. That's all there is to it. You going walk over me? She asked. No, ma'am, I'm going round you, I said, but I'm going to make the coffee. I filled the kettle with water and set it on the stove. My aunt was watching me. Her friends sitting at the table were, were quiet. Grant, Vivian said, I think, just be quiet. You taken over my house, my aunt said. No, ma'am, I said, but we drank the coffee, and this is the woman I'm going to marry one day, so you might as well start getting along right now. The women at the table did not look at us and were afraid to look at one another. My aunt was like a boulder in the road, unmovable, so I had to go around her. She could see that I was not going to change my mind, and she had three choices. She could stop me physically. She could leave the room, or she could sit down at the table with her friends. She was afraid to approach me physically, because I might leave and not come back. If she left the kitchen, then her friends would leave. If she sat at the table, only her pride would be hurt. So she thought that was best. How was service today, Miss Eloise? I asked. Oh, fine. She said it so fast it sounded like only one word. I grinned to myself. You find anything funny in that, mister? My aunt said, looking at me again. No, ma'am, I said. She stared at me long enough to let me know that it was not over between her and me. Not yet. She turned to Vivian, not saying anything, just contemplating her. The other women were quiet, looking either down at the table or out the back door, but never at one another. I hear you from Free La Cove, my aunt said to Vivian. Yes, ma'am. I hear they don't like dark-skinned people back there. Some of them don't, Vivian said. Not all of them, my aunt questioned her. No, ma'am. How about your own folks? I don't visit back there, Vivian said. You don't love your mama? You don't love your daddy? I love them both, Vivian said and looked at me. But, you have, but I have to live my own life. You go to church? I'm Catholic. My aunt looked at Vivian and nodded her head as if she was thinking, what else could you possibly be? You went to church today? I went to nine o'clock mass, Vivian said. You going next Sunday? Yes, ma'am. Sunday after that? I hope so. This one, my aunt said, nodding toward me, but still looking at Vivian. He don't have a church. What y'all going to do then? We'll work it out, Vivian said. You going to leave your church? I hope I don't have to, Vivian said, but if I had to, then I suppose I would. You'll leave your church and just become nothing? We'll work it out, Vivian said. My aunt nodded her head. I hope you know what you're doing, young lady. I think that water is hot, I said. I poured water over the fresh coffee grounds and watched the container fill up. And when the level went down, I poured in more water. Now the aroma of the coffee had taken over from the lady's powder, or maybe it was because I was closer to the coffee pot than I was to the table. Get some dishes out of that safe, I said to Vivian. Cups and saucers and four plates for cake. Grant? Just do what I said, I told her. She brought the four cups and saucers to the stove on a tray, and I poured hot water into one of the cups. Vivian rinsed out all the other cups and poured the water into the dishpan on the window sh shelf. She set the tray of cups on the shelf and went back to the safe and began to cut slices of cake and put them on plates. By the time she had finished, enough coffee had dripped and I was pouring it into the cups. Vivian put a fork on each plate and placed cake before the women. They said thanks, but they said it quietly. Vivian came back to the window for the coffee. Everyone said thanks again. Thank you, ma'am, my aunt said politely. My aunt knew how to make you feel that she was of a lower caste and you were being too kind to her. That was the picture she presented, but not nearly how she felt. Vivian and I went out onto the porch. 
I'm glad to get out of there, Vivian said. She pulled that jazz on others, I said. It's not going to work this time, though. Well, I see that mine are not the only ones, Vivian said. It's not the same thing, I said. Far from being the same thing, Vivian became very quiet. Then, well, I better be going. Something I said. No, it's getting late, that's all. I have to get my purse and tell them goodbye. She went back inside, and she must have stood a good distance away from the table because I could hear them clearly from the porch. I've come to say I'm leaving, Vivian said. It was good meeting you all. There was silence a while. Then I heard my aunt saying, You're a lady of quality. Quality ain't cheap. Thank you, ma'am. Don't give up God, my aunt said. No matter what, don't ever do that. Yes, ma'am. You're a lady of quality, my aunt repeated. And a pretty young lady, too, Miss Eloise said. That's for sure, Inez chipped in. A pretty young lady. Good manners. Quality is what you have. Quality. They were quiet again. Maybe they didn't have any more to say. Vivian came back outside and we went out to the car. Well, what do you think of the place? I asked her. Still think it's pastoral? It is pastoral, she said, looking around. One of the Washington boys and a Hebert girl came from up the quarter holding hands. They had just left church. The boy wearing a black suit, a white shirt, and a tie. The girl wore a light blue coat over her dress. Both of them spoke to me at the same time, saying, How are you, Mr. Wiggins? And they nodded to Vivian as they went by us, still holding hands. Good luck, I thought to myself. Vivian was watching them, too, as they continued down the quarter. I'm glad I met your aunt and her friends, she said. They'll have a lot to talk about, I said. You think I did okay? With all that quality, how could you fail? Vivian smiled without opening her mouth. I kissed her on the tip of her nose. Uh-uh, she said, not in public. I have too much quality for that. Chapter 16 I was walking around the schoolyard with my ruler when I saw my aunt, Reverend Ambrose, and Miss Emma come back down the quarter after seeing Jefferson. The car stopped in front of Miss Emma's house, and the three of them got out and went into the yard. Reverend Ambrose looked over his shoulder toward the church, but the picket fence kept him from seeing me. After they had gone inside the house, I continued around the schoolyard, slapping my leg with the ruler. It was a quarter to three, nearly time to dismiss the children for the day. I re-entered the church through the front door. Irene Cole and another girl and a boy stood at one of the blackboards. We had discussed our Christmas program, and now they were writing down names of the students who would bring the Christmas tree, as well as those who would decorate it. I went to my desk and tapped my ruler for attention. It's about time to go home. Any questions before we dismiss? Irene? No, sir, she said from the blackboard. Marshall and Clarence and Alec are getting the tree. Surely Odessa and I will see that it's decorated. Mr. Joseph's got some lint cotton in his crib, and we can get some crepe paper from Miss Eloise. She said she had a lot left over from making the Mardi Gras hats. What about the tree, Clarence? Guess we'll just go back in the pasture and get one like we did last year, he grinned. You think you might be able to find a little pine tree this time? We'll try, he said and laughed to himself. The year before, the boys had brought in a small oak tree. They had dragged it through the mud all the way from the pasture, and by the time it got to the school, it had lost many of its leaves. The girls who were to decorate the tree had to wash it clean before putting on the lint cotton and crepe paper. It turned out to be a beautiful Christmas tree. One other thing before we dismiss class. I want you all to remember one person during this Christmas season. I'm sure I don't have to remind you who I'm thinking about. If there are no other questions, you may collect your things and leave. And I don't want to hear any noise out there in the quarter. Class dismissed. After they had gone, I sat down at the table looking over the test I had given the sixth graders in geography. The assignment was to draw a map of Louisiana and write in the names of the parishes in their appropriate places. After about five minutes, I heard footsteps entering the church, 
and, th and then saw that one of the boys had stopped halfway down the aisle. I knew what he was going to tell me. Miss Emma say, on your way home, stop by. I nodded my head and he left, walking slowly until he got to door, and then he burst out running. I gathered up all my papers, and after closing and locking the back door, I went out through the front. Miss Emma's house was only a short distance down the quarter. They were sitting at the kitchen table drinking coffee when I came in. Some coffee? Miss Emma asked me. No, ma'am. Thomas said you wanted to see me. Sit down, Grant, she said. I could tell by the way she said it and by the silence of my aunt and Reverend Ambrose that things had not gone well at the jail. I pulled out a chair and sat down facing Miss Emma. My aunt and Reverend Ambrose sat opposite each other. You didn't tell me the truth the other day, did you? Miss Emma said. I don't know what you're talking about, Miss Emma. When you come back from seeing him. Sure, I told you the truth, I said. No. She shook her head, pressing her lips tight as she looked across the table at me. He didn't like the food. He didn't ask about me. He did last Friday. No, she said and shook her head again. Cause I had to hit him today. She stared at me, her lip, lips pressed tight, and she lowered her head. Reverend Ambrose reached out and touched one of her arms, and he said, Sister Emma, Sister Emma. My aunt put her hand on the other arm and looked at me. A couple of days later, Miss Eloise came up to the house, and from my room, I could hear my aunt telling her what had happened. Jefferson was asleep or pretended to be asleep when they got to the cell. The deputy rattled the big keys against the bars and called Jefferson's name before opening the door. After they had gone inside, the deputy locked the door and told them that he would be back within the hour. They could call if they wanted to leave earlier. Jefferson lay on the bunk with his back to them, and there was no place for them to sit. Miss Emma managed to get a small place to sit by pushing him gently closer to the wall. She passed her hand over his head and his shoulder while she whispered his name. Ain't you going to speak to me, she said. Ain't you going to speak to your company? Finally, he turned, looking in their direction. He wasn't seeing them, my aunt told Miss Eloise. He acted as though they were not even in the room. His eyes were a total blank, my aunt said. Just blank, blank, was how she said it. I brought you some food, Miss Emma told him. I bought you a shirt, too, a pretty shirt. Do you want to see it? She took a Polish shirt from the paper bag and spread it out with both hands. But he showed no sign of seeing the shirt or even hearing Miss Emma. Reverend Ambrose went up to the bunk and said to him, Young man, I pray for you every night, and I know the Lord is hearing my prayers. Put all your faith in him, and he'll bring you through. That touched something in him. He looked up at the reverend, and for a moment it seemed that he would say something, something cruel, mean, my aunt said. She said that standing back looking at him, she could see his hate for Reverend Ambrose. Miss Emma put the shirt back into the bag and opened the basket with the food. Come on, eat something for me, she said. I brought all the best things you like. You brought corn, his voice said. Not him, my aunt said, just the voice. He didn't show a thing in his face. His eyes were blank. Blank, my aunt said. Corn? Miss Emma asked. He didn't answer her. Roast nears? He looked at her, but he didn't answer. And his eyes were just blank, 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 my aunt said. He could have been looking at the wall or the floor for all the recognition he showed her. These ain't roast nears season, Jefferson. Miss Emma told him, that's in the spring, this November. Roast near's all over now. He didn't look at her with hate as he had the reverend, but there was no pity either, my aunt said. He didn't show any feeling at all. Corn for a hog, he said. Corn for a hog? A hog, Jefferson? You ain't no hog, Jefferson. You ain't no hog. Thou something, he said. I'll never throw you nothing, Jefferson, Miss Emma said. You throw bone to a dog, slop to a hog. You ain't no hog. That's all I'm is, he said. He turned away from her. I didn't ask to be born. Jefferson, Miss Emma said. Jefferson, he wouldn't answer her. 
and all sh and she used all her great bulk to pull him over. You ain't no hog, you hear me? You ain't no hog. That's all I'm is, he said. I'm fattening up to. She slapped him. Then she fell upon him and cried. My aunt told Miss Eloise. My aunt and Reverend Ambrose went to the bunk and tried to pull her away, but she was still slumped over him when the deputy came back to let them go. At her kitchen table now, as I sat there, Miss Emma looked at my aunt. What I done, Lou? She asked. What I done, done? What I done, done, my master to deserve this? My aunt saw that she was going to cry, and she stood up and put her arm around her shoulders. Emma, she said, Emma, the Lord is merciful. What I done, done? She was shaking her head and crying now. What I done, done, my master? Have patience, my aunt said, patting her on the shoulder. The Lord is merciful. What I done, done, she cried, to make my master hate me so? The Lord don't hate you, Sister Emma, Reverend Ambrose said, touching her on the arm. The Lord is with you this moment. He is only testing you. Miss Emma looked up at me. The tears were still rolling down her face. Go back, she said. Why, Miss Emma? Cause somebody going to do something for me before I die. Why me? Cause you the teacher, my aunt said. I got up from the table. And where you think you're going? Tante Lou asked me. I don't know, I said, but I'll go crazy if I stay here, that's for sure. You going back up there, Grant? What for, I said. What for, Tante Lou? He treated me the same way he treated her. He wants me to feel guilty, just as he wants her to feel guilty. Well, I'm not feeling guilty, Tante Lou. I didn't put him there. I do everything I know how to do to keep people like him from going there. He's not going to make me feel guilty. You going back, she said. You ain't going to run away from this, Grant. Tante Lou, I said, I want to take her face in my hands. I want to hold her gently, gently, because anger and screaming were not working. Maybe gentleness would work better. Maybe feeling my hands on her face would make her feel, make her understand what I was trying to say to her. That as I moved toward her, I could see in her eyes that nothing I said was going to change anything. I left them at the table and went back home to my room.